I think we hit six figures. You know, my my I, I do these ten surprises every year, and, and one of mine was you know that we hit six figures. I, we definitely take out the all time high. Mm. That could happen in days, right? Sure. Once people realize that these ETFs are taking out more Bitcoin out of the market than is mined every day, and after the halving, it's going to be two or three times mm. that. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which is a great crypto platform that I've been using since 2018. Uphold has all the top cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and all the altcoins. In fact, they have 260 plus cryptocurrencies on their platform. You can also trade precious metals, stable coins, and 37 fiat currencies. In addition, they are available in over 150 countries. And this platform is fully reserved. They do audits. So you can trust that your funds are safe. No commingling, no lending out your funds. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Mark Yusko, who's the founder, CEO, and CIO at Morgan Creek Capital Management. Mark, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Happy New Year, although we're starting to get outside that window where I can say that anymore, but good to see you in the new year. Yeah, absolutely. Happy New Year. Uh, We've been talking for years, Mark. You know, we touch on quite a few different topics, but what a historic start to 2024. We had the Bitcoin spot ETFs approved. I would love to get your thoughts on the launch and how trading has been going. Look, I, you know, people are talking about it in different ways. You know, there's people saying, oh, it was a total failure. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, we set all time records for ETF trading on the first day when you put together the basket, it was $4.6 billion of trading in the first day. Like, oh, but there was only a few hundred million of net inflows because GBTC was being liquidated. I'm like, sure. I mean, did did people expect on day one, all the you know, advisors out there would say, oh, you know, I, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> Clearly, I should rush out and and load up. No, it's going to take time for education. You know, all the advertisements are going to come. You're going to have, I mean, you go to blackrock.com, Yeah, their landing page, their main landing page for the whole firm is an ad or the the one pager for iBit, their Bitcoin ETF. So that, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a really big deal. And so here we are four days into trading and we've got a billion dollars of net new money into IBIT. We've got two and a half billion dollars of capital across what well, they call them the newborn nine. Uh, and then, you know, GBTC converted. And, and yes, it's losing assets because they kept their fees really, really high. Um, knowing that the people who had a big tax gain aren't going to sell over fees. So it's kind of a little bit of a cash grab because they've got some challenges, uh, I think, over at at DCG. But bottom line, I think it was a tremendous launch, uh, tremendous day for uh, digital assets broadly. Um, You know, all the maxis are upset because, you know, these people don't own Bitcoin. You're right. Technically, you're right. The Bitcoin was created so you and I or anyone else could exchange value without an intermediary. So, no, these people are not going to hold their keys and they're not going to put it in cold storage. But here's the thing. There's going to be a transition from TradFi, traditional finance with trusted third parties, to ultimately DeFi or NoFi, right, where there's there's no in, uh, trusted third parties. This is going to take time, but this is a great stepping stone for people to add what has been, you know, the best performing asset over the last decade. It's actually been the best performing asset 12 of the 15 years it's been in existence. Most people have zero exposure, mm-hmm. not people listen to the podcast, but, but most people yeah. have zero and you know, I've been talking about this since 2017, 18, right? Get off zero. Zero 
is the wrong number. Now, I'm not saying 100% or 90% or 80%, but zero is just wrong. Yeah. And you want to have some of this asset in your portfolio for lots of different reasons, for the low correlation to other assets, it protects your portfolio, for the fact that it is a store of value against devaluation of the currency. That was the big one for me. When Larry Fink, right, who's the head of the largest asset manager on the planet, BlackRock, who six years ago said this was an index of money laundering. Yeah. Bitcoin was an index of money laundering. For him to then come on CNBC and say, no, it's a store of value that you should own to protect yourself against the devaluation of the currency. Mm. And I just read the stat right before I came on with you. Crazy. So we've added $1 trillion of debt to the national debt in the last three months. Now, just again, to put that in perspective, you and I would have to sit here together for 31,710 years and spend a dollar every second. Mm. That's $1 trillion. So it took 199 years to get the first trillion of debt in this republic. And the last trillion came in three months. So what does that mean for the purchasing power of our fiat, the money that we're paid for our work and our service and our, our lives? Well, it's going down. Yeah. And I don't have to tell anybody who has gone out to lunch lately or bought a coffee lately or tried to buy a house lately. The value of the money is going down. It's being devalued by the creation of this, what I call the fiat fiasco. And so having a portion of your wealth in this asset that is the antithesis of an inflationary fiat currency, it's a deflationary store of value, it's just a, a logical, rational thing to do. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Mark, to your point, um, the inflows for the Bitcoin spot ETFs have been growing. And look, we're just, what, four or five days in. Uh, BlackRock, their Bitcoin ETF, over a billion dollars. I think it totaled 10 billion in trading volume. Uh, so we are seeing growth, and it's a crawl, walk, run phase um, uh, to, to you know the growth and more inflows and so forth. So do you see a major marketing blitz happening over the next 12 months as we head into the next bull market? You Possibly a Super Bowl ad. I don't you know. know. I, I hope there's no Super Bowl <laughs> ad because I think Super Bowl ads are, are a waste of money, personally. Sure. I mean, I, I, they're good entertainment, but yeah. I just don't don't think they're they're very useful. And there's unfortunately, there's a perfect inverse correlation between mm. success of businesses and how much money they spend in Super Bowl ads. It's not a really good track record. So I hope we don't have one. We might, but Super Bowl ads tend to happen at peaks in hype. Sure. I don't think we're anywhere <laughs> near a peak in hype. Now, I think what you are going to see is a blitzkrieg of television ads, internet ads, you know, web page ads. Like if you go to Kathy Woods, ARC, you know, 21 shares, you're going to see uh, front page. If you go to Fidelity, you're going to see front page. You go to BlackRock, you're going to see front page, all talking about Bitcoin. And I think that's positive. The yeah. media campaign is not just media and not just, you know, like brainwashing, but real education. Because yeah. ultimately what you have here is... You have the haves, right? My brethren and sisterin, us, us boomers, right? To be born from 46 to 64. So I'm the second to last year in 63. And all of us, we own a lot of stuff, right? We have lots of assets, like tens and tens of trillions of dollars of assets. And what we don't have is a lot of education and knowledge which is, you know, the next generation, the millennials and the Zoomers have on, on, on digital assets. And so this education process has to happen. And look, we have the boomers like Peter Schiff and Nouriel and all these guys, 
you know, it's it's going to zero. It's going to I'm like, hey guys, you've been saying it's going to zero for 13 years. I went back and looked for 13 years. They've been saying the same nonsense. Mm -hmm. And now we're nearly a trillion dollars of value in the greatest computing network of all time. And this is the this is the thing. There's little B Bitcoin, right? The or I should say big B Bitcoin, the, the token. And there's little B Bitcoin, which is this network. Mm -hmm. The token, yeah, it has no cash flow, it creates no value. That's not what it's supposed to do. It is a store of value, like gold. The network, the Bitcoin network, is the most powerful computing platform the world has ever seen. It's a better way to store information without the need for a trusted third party, mm -hmm. right? A triple entry accounting system is one of the great innovations of our time, and that technology is never going away. More and more assets are going to migrate to that. In fact, ultimately, I'll argue every asset in the world, stocks, bonds, currencies, commodities, everything. And actually, Larry Fink was saying this. It was funny. He he was saying this on CNBC, and I sent out a video I did a couple of years ago, said, is he watching my stuff? I mean, literally, he's like, not word for word, but I, I say that immodestly. I mean, Larry's a smart guy. But Everything is ultimately going to settle on these ledgers. Mm -hmm. And a ledger, and a token, is just an entry on a ledger. It's not a little piece of gold coin somewhere. It's just an entry on a ledger, but it's permanent. It's immutable. It's not corruptible. You know, our current system is full of corruption. Think, look at all the fines paid by the banks, you know, over $360 billion of fines for money laundering and you know, backing the wrong people and arms dealing and all kinds of stuff that they get in trouble for over the years because monopolies don't really have to pay attention to the rules, right? They mm -hmm. they can do what they want. Now, they can get censored by regulatory bodies like the SEC. But at the end of the day, my favorite was when J.P. Morgan, right, whose CEO was on TV yesterday yes. saying that Bitcoin was shit. He actually yeah, he called it. I mean, he, he didn't say it was shit. He said, and shit like this, right? which is kind of calling it shit. But he's out there and he's calling it, you know, only used for money laundering and, and like, okay, but remember your firm. Yeah was fined $960 million two years ago for manipulating the price of gold. Yep. And their quote was, well, yeah, we we did, but we made $20 billion. So that was just like a cost of doing business. Yeah. And so the hypocrisy of that is, is crazy. Now, there are those that said, you know, Jamie's an idiot. And he's a no, 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 guys. You're looking at it the wrong way. Mm -hmm. He's not an idiot. Yeah. He's a smart man. He he's you know, he's a boomer, but whatever. Maybe he doesn't know as much about, but he's playing dumb like a fox. Yeah. Here's the thing. I look at it very differently. This happened two years in a row. He's at Davos and he gets his 10 minutes on CNBC. He could talk about anything he wants. Anything. Yeah. He could talk about climate change. He could talk about the new world order. He could talk about anything he wants. And he ends up talking about Bitcoin. Right. That's freaking cool. I think that's really cool because <laughs> he literally could say, you know, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Like but, I got, Mark, I got media. Anyway. I was just literally saying that yesterday on, on, on yesterday's podcast that it's almost like a Jim Cramer contrarian uh, indicator keep being bullish uh Jamie because for since 2017 he said the same thing over and over and Bitcoin continues to grow in adoption and look at where we're at right now so maybe it's a good thing yeah it's like the Jim Cramer effect oh it's a totally good thing but think about it <laughs> incentives show me the incentive this is Charlie Munger you know God rest his soul show me the incentive I'll show you the outcome yeah what does Jamie Diamond do he runs the largest bank in the world well, second largest bank of international settlements bigger, but but he he runs one of the largest banks in the world. It's a really powerful guy. So wait a minute. What does blockchain technology do? 
it does to financial services what the internet did to media and uh, commerce. Mm-hmm. Right? Amazon exists because of the the uh, internet. And mom and pop shops, a lot of them went out of business because you can buy it from Amazon. Same thing's going to happen to finance. So he runs a financial services firm that is threatened by this new technology, Bitcoin being one manifestation of it. And so, yeah, he's nervous. Yeah. My, other, my other view is you can always judge the quality of an idea by the quality of its detractors. Mm-hmm. Right? If you have an idea and no one who's important or meaningful hates it, it's probably not really that big an idea. If you have an idea and people who have power and influence don't like it, you're on to something. Mm-hmm. And you can go back in history, you know, from, you know, we just had Martin Luther King Day, right? He had some detractors in really high places and mm-hmm. probably ended up, you know, costing him his life for that, right? For taking wow. a stand for human rights and, and civil rights. But if nobody cared about that, then it wouldn't have been a big idea. But it was a really big idea. Yeah. And one, I personally am very grateful for for him, you know, starting it. Or not starting. I mean, he was one of the people that started it. But yeah. Right. Yeah, Mark. And look, I think the dirty little secrets about JP Morgan, um, which I think a lot of people don't know, they were investing in uh, consensus, which is building Ethereum back in 2017, you're building JPM coin. They did a private fork of Ethereum called Quorum. So while he's trashing Bitcoin, these things are happening. Uh, JP Morgan will be a participant in some of these Bitcoin ETFs. So, and I wish the media, if I'll put it raw as possible, had the balls to just bring those things up. No, these- look, a- amen, amen. And and look, you that that is some amazingly important insight that you bring up. So when you think about it, Bitcoin is the pure solution, right? It is proof of work. It is, you know, about broad consensus, about this powerful computing platform. And, you know, Jamie said, you know, Satoshi or whatever his name is, (laughs) Satoshi, Jamie, Satoshi is going to come and he's going to just create a bunch more. He's going to be laughing at you. And Jameson Lopp, one of the core developers, said, here are the five lines of code that cannot be changed by any one person. Now, if we all decided collectively to make changes, we can do that. And any change that's beneficial to the network, we'll probably all approve. But anything not beneficial to the network is not going to get through, no matter who you are. So, because, you know, Satoshi, whoever he, she, they are, he identified as a he once, so probably a he, or maybe a group of he's actually said, I'm giving up my project, so I'm not in charge anymore. And so what's interesting about about all of that is there are these other blockchains that are centralized Mm -hmm. and different levels of centralization, but, but they're centralized. And it's not shocking at all that the Bank of International Settlements and World Economic Forum are working with things like XRP and Stellar because those are centralized. And XRP people are going to hate when I say that, but but they are. <laughs> and that's what they want. They want private blockchains, permission blockchains. And even Ethereum and consensus and, and its ties to the banking system says to me that it's permissioned. Mm -hmm. I want to live permissionless. And I'm tired of having the bank have to give me permission to get my money or a brokerage firm give me permission to take my securities and, and transact with you. In a permissionless world, banks, brokerage, insurance companies, auditors, accountants, they're less important. And that's why this is so feared. But just like every innovation, right? The internet was feared. Air travel was feared. Automobile. The radio was feared. Mm-hmm. Television was feared. Electricity was feared. There are these great pictures from the 1900s. Oh, yeah. Electric wires and these demons coming out. <laughs> like it was going to ruin the world and it was going to poison everybody. 
No, electricity is awesome. It makes my life so good. It makes what we're doing possible. And blockchain is the same thing. Bitcoin is, is the same thing. So it it's it's big. It's here to stay. And here's the thing. There's 30 trillion, 30 trillion in boomer accounts managed by financial advisors. It's a lot. 30 mm -hmm. trillion. If 10 basis points goes into these ETFs, okay, that's 30 billion dollars on an asset that trades about 10 billion dollars a day that'll move the price a lot if one percent which is not even crazy one percent should be like the minimum you should put in i'd argue two three five eight ten but one is the minimum that's 300 billion mm. on an asset with a current market cap of around 900 billion so we're talking about a really really big growing demand. And what people forget, when GBTC launched, they raised about 10-ish billion dollars of new fiat that went into GBTC. And uh, the price of Bitcoin went from about 10,000 to 59,000 in a matter of months. I mean, it was a total parabola. And yes, then it crashed down to 30, and then it went back to 69. And then it crashed all the way down to uh, 15. And today, you know, we're, we're closer to 69 than we are 15. Mm -hmm. So that, I think history is going to rhyme. And so as that parabola, as that FOMO picks up later this year, post the halving, and we get into what's called crypto fall, which is when all of the activity and the media attention and... I think we could go very, very quickly mm. from where we are today to, to six-digit Bitcoin. I mean, like faster than people can imagine. Yeah, I'm thinking the same because of um, we were so close at 69 and with these ETFs and the amount of attention it's getting, more awareness and you know the marketing that's coming, that could certainly happen. I don't know if you saw this morning, I just pull it up. Uh, the block reported that Bitcoin surpassed silver to become the second largest ETF commodity in the U.S. Uh, moving really quickly here, uh, it's, it's, uh, and I can't imagine you know it's going to go for gold. And I don't know if it's going to happen this cycle, but maybe in the future cycles. But yeah, look, it. I, I think this is the year. Twenty twenty four. I think is the year where people finally understand that Bitcoin is digital gold. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean. Gold is this amazing asset. It's an asset that is money, right? It's actually one of only two or three monies in the world. Money is an asset that exists in the absence of a liability. Everything else that we think of as money, dollars, yen, euros, are not, not, not money. They're currency. Currency is backed by debt. And money has to exist with no associated liability. And it has to be given value, ascribed value by use and custom. Okay. And I, I love that there was a, a, a video years ago of a guy selling yak meat, like back in ancient times. And this guy walks up with a chicken and gives him oh, the yeah. chicken and gives him the yak meat. And then a guy walks up and gives him gold. He's like, the hell is that? Well, it's gold. So what do I want that for? I can't eat it. I can't use it. I mean, I can't sell it. He says, just trust me. It's going to catch on. <laughs> and it, you know, the, the idea that a piece of shiny yellow rock would be the thing that we all for 5,000 years would use to ascribe value. Well, the reason is because of scarcity, mm -hmm. right? The stock to flow ratio, the amount of new production relative to what's used or lost or stolen is roughly equal. So the stock, okay, the amount to flow is very high, which mm -hmm. means your scarcity value is very high. Well, Bitcoin actually just passed gold in terms of the stock to flow, the amount that's created every year versus what's lost or stolen. Okay. And that stock to flow ratio means that it's very scarce. Well, scarcity is one element. You also need something to be portable. Mm -hmm. Gold actually isn't really that portable. And the real problem with gold is it's not very divisible. 
Like if I had a bar right here, right now, and I wanted to break it in half, and I think I'm pretty in shape guy, but you know, not really, but I'm not strong, right? I could not break that bar of gold, even if I were super strong, right? Even if I were Arnold, right? And I could, even he couldn't do it. <laughs> I could stuff it into my computer and send it to you. Right. Well, I can hit a couple buttons and send you Bitcoin, like instantaneously. Mm -hmm. And I could do it to 100,000 units, Satoshis, per, I mean, 100 million units per Bitcoin. And this is, I, I feel sorry for Samantha. She's a very nice lady, Samantha Dulac. And she, you know, uh, she basically just misspoke, right? And said, well, I don't understand, you know, it's Satoshi's. That just means it could be infinitely divisible and, and create infinitely more. It's like, you mean if you take a pizza, you can cut it into infinite pieces and feed the world? Really? Is that is that what you're saying? There's still one pizza. But anyway, so I feel badly for her. And as I said, she's a very nice lady. But um, Satoshi's are just a, a devising unit that allow us to not have to think in full Bitcoin at 50,000 bucks, but right. in terms of, of pennies or, or Satoshi's. So ultimately we'll get to that point. And there's lots and lots and lots of Satoshi's 2.1 quadrillion, which is why my hashtag uh, on my, my Twitter handle um, says 2.1 quadrillion, but that's, where we're headed and divisibility, portability, and this idea that triple entry accounting is just better. It's a better system. Mm -hmm. Now, Mark, not everyone is a fan of Bitcoin or the Bitcoin ETFs. We have Vanguard and Merrill acting very strangely. I don't know if this is posturing or what they're doing. Politics. <laughs> yeah, Politics. So, yeah, maybe you can give us some insights here. And do you feel that eventually their board or your CFO, somebody's going to say, hey, we're losing out on fees here. What are we doing? And they could well, be so it, it's 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 got two parts. It's again it's a really good question. Hi everyone, pardon the interruption. I'm Tony Edward, the founder and host of the Thinking Crypto Podcast. I have a huge favor to ask you. If you haven't subscribed as yet on YouTube or the podcast platforms, hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, hit the notification bell on the YouTube platform, and on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast. It allows me to bring great quality content to you. Thank you for your support, and I'll let you get back to the content. So on the, on the surface, it's total politics, right? Mm -hmm. Gary Gensler, and I shouldn't criticize the guy that regulates me, so I'm not criticizing him per se, but... I'm just stating what I believe to be fact. He did not want to approve these ETFs. Yeah. And if we're up to him, he would not have. And it was says, but he voted. He voted, thumbs up, I believe, my, my belief, I'm entitled to my belief, because he was forced by the courts, Absolutely. right? He got sued twice. He lost once to um, Grayscale, and he's about to lose to Coinbase. So- he had, had no choice. Now, Ms. Warren and all the other politicians were like, no, don't do it. Don't do it. And they tried to force him. He said, look, I, 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 I have to. So he did. But all those groups, Vanguard, Merrill, Bank of America, are very tightly aligned with Ms. Warren. If you look at Ms. Warren's biggest contributors, guess mm. who they are? Mm. And she or someone like her made a call and said, don't allow your customer. Now, I find irony. In fact, if you look up the term Vanguard in the dictionary, it says embracing new ideas, being on the leading edge, that, that is what Vanguard means. And they're saying you can't spend your money on something you want to buy. That's like the antithesis of the name of the firm. And it's funny, I I did a, a hashtag right after it happened, said set sail, right? Just leave. You don't have to stay. Right. And someone did a great thing. They took their logo, which is an old <laughs> clipper ship, and they made it sick. Yeah. And I just love that because that's people are going to vote with their feet. Now, the yeah. flip side of this is 
what they're saying is all you young people, all you millennials, Zoomers, we don't give a shit. We got the boomers and the boomers don't want this. They want us to be the buttoned up Wall Street types to say, no, this is bad. That's fair. That is a that is a but that is a calculated decision. I will argue made by boomers because mm -hmm. boomers are the ones running the firm. That has a limited lifespan. Right. Because here's the thing. All of us, every single one of us is going to die. Yeah. Every single one of us. I mean, everyone eventually, but the boomers first. And we're all going to die. And all that money that we think we have yeah. is going to y'all. It's going to the Zoomers and the millennials. And so if, if Vanguard and Merrill Lynch and Bank of America and UBS piss off those people, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. They're just going to leave. So their mom or dad, their grandpa or aunt is going to bequeath them the money and they're going to take it out. And I actually see this. I have a family harmony account at UBS. My brother-in-law is a, a financial advisor and he took over his dad's book and all his dad's clients are passing on, right? They're eighties and nineties and some even a hundred and the kids come and they take all the money out. Mm. He gets about 10% that stay 90% just leave. And now by fanning the flames of this digital divide, I just think it's a bad idea. I mean, 29% mm -hmm. of millennials own Bitcoin, 4% of boomers. Okay. So with the ETFs, that four is going to go to 40. My number picked out of the air, like 85% of statistics made up on the spot. So, uh, and that 29 eventually is going to be a hundred. I mean, I say this all the time. My use a prop. I have a, I have three grandkids, one, three, and five. My youngest is a Gen A. Actually, I think all three are actually Gen A, but but my I always talk about my youngest because she's one. She'll never have one of these. She will never have a leather wallet. Mm. In her whole life, she'll never have, she will not know what paper money is. Right. Not ever. And so she will grow up using digital assets. She will grow up exchanging digital assets, stable coins and Bitcoin and whatever. That's a different world. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you can cling to this big nest egg that you've created for yourself at Vanguard and others. But I just think it's a bad, a bad decision because no matter how much you don't want the future to happen, if you're an incumbent, it's going to happen. Happen, yeah. And Darwin said it best, although I guess he never actually said this. We all attribute it to him. Adapt or die. Yeah. Right. Those are your only two choices. I mean, I'm a biology guy. I, I, I love, I'm, you know, biology, there are two states, only two growth and death. Mm. You're either growing or you're dying. And I prefer this one. And if I were in charge of these big firms, which I'm not, I would be embracing. Now people say, but if you embrace the new, then you're going to piss off the old and they're all going to leave. Where are they going to go? They're not going to leave. They're very but, comfortable. Inertia is an amazing thing. But Mark, this is not even, you're not forcing your clients. You're just offering. If you choose to pay. Uh, of course you are. Of yeah. course you are. But there are some that say, well, if you won't protect me by outlawing and just think of the ridiculousness of that statement. That's silly. Protect me? Why would you be with a... You don't need protection. You're a human being. Make your own decisions. Be an adult. And it's kind of like... Well, it's kind of like this whole craze of, you know, the new weight loss drugs. And it's like, well, you need to protect me from myself because I don't have the self-discipline not to eat the crappy food. I'm like, what? Yeah. No. So if... I mean, we shouldn't buy the crappy food and we shouldn't ingest the crappy food, but you know, we've got a whole industry that is designed and there'll be a lot of Super Bowl ads for crappy food. Yeah. Um, don't don't get me wrong. Uh, and it doesn't, and I'm not pure. I eat crappy food sometimes too, but I try to stay away from it most days. Right. And anyway, so 
we'll we'll see what happens. But I think ultimately, it's a big deal. The ETFs are a big deal. The future of digital assets is stronger than it's ever been. The pace of adoption is nearing the knee of the curve, right? You know, the first decade, it feels like forever, mm. okay? You get 20% in the first decade. And then the S curve takes off and you get the next 80% over the next decade. So we got 10 years starting this year, 2024 to 2034 uh, or 2033, um, when my youngest will graduate from college and I'll be 70, which is kind of wild. Um, all I say, that's the new 50, 70 is the new 50. And I'm, I'm cool <laughs> with that. Um, but that 10 years is going to be magical in so yeah. many ways. And those who choose to, you know, listen to your podcast and listen to your advice and, 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 and do the things that, that make sense for the future will surge. And those that resist the future and and fear it will will lag. And that's just the way life goes, right? If you, uh, it's my pin tweet, right? Yeah. The greatest wealth is created by investing in innovation. In order to do that, you have to invest in things you believe in before others even understand. When you do that, you'll be mocked and ridiculed for your non-consensus action. Totally worth it. Mm -hmm. now, now, Mark, uh, with the ETF approvals, have you and the folks at Morgan Creek seen an uptick in interest and demand for a crypto? So, yes and no. Still really hard to fundraise because people are still smarting from the bear market mm. and they have denominator problems in their private portfolio. But, but one thing that we had this conversation just this morning, a year ago, we couldn't get kind of marketing groups to talk to us to help us with with fundraising mm. now they're like pouring over the wall everybody's mm. like okay i see it i see it yeah this is real now i think i'm right they, they still are nervous that their clients aren't ready yeah. remember the people who have the wealth and this is not an insult to young people it's just facts right when you're younger there are exceptions there are young people who do really really well but on average a 65 year old is going to have more than 25 or 35 or 45 year old. Just, just oh, yeah. it. And that's, again, that's not criticism, but they know that those people control the assets, the big pensions and the pension board members are not young people. They're older people. And so they're a little bit nervous and trepidatious, but yes, we are starting to see a pickup in interest. They're starting to be more inbound and and, and that's good. And because, but it's, it's not an overnight thing. This is a, I didn't, I didn't do this for five months or five years. You know, to me, I call it my chapter three, right? Mm. Like chapter one, I'd spent 20 years working in not-for-profits. And then chapter two, I spent 20 years doing allocation and building an asset management business. And now for 20 years, I'm five years in for 15 more years, I'll, I'll do digital asset uptake. And, and I say the last 20 years I'll teach. And um, that, that sounds good to me. Mm. Um, now there are talks of an Ethereum spot ETF potentially on the horizon. Uh, BlackRock has thrown their hat in a ring. But of course, there's still problems going on with the SEC and uh, yeah. even Chair Genser not outwardly saying if Ethereum is a security or not. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think we see that this year or possibly 2025? It's a tough one. You know, if if I just if it just went on on the fact pattern, I'd say zero chance anytime soon because even though Gary's waffled on this, he basically said the only reason I approved the Bitcoin is because the courts for forced me. Sure. So unless consensus or somebody else like that sues the SEC, I mean, BlackRock's an opportunist. BlackRock is all about the money. They're they're very smart. And if if they saw the writing on the wall that the SEC would be forced to approve, they would certainly do one. Um, but I, I just think right now, there's no impetus to force them to approve. And remember, 
the way the, the, the SEC board is made up right now, there's five members. Only one is really logical, Hester. I mean, she's amazing. The other three are totally politicos and, and Gary's Gary. So now I will give one of the three politicos did vote yes. So I, I, I will give them some credit. I That shocked me. Um, you wait out, right? Yeah. So that, that did shock me, but you know, I, I thank them. Um, but the other two, but we're likely to get a change in the Oval Office this year. I mean, mm -hmm. not, not for sure, but, but pretty likely. And then they could clean house in, in the SEC and, and change the balance of power and, and uh, then, so I'd say 2025 is probably a better, better shot. Mm. Um, now, Mark, this year, from a macro standpoint, there are talks of the Fed potentially cutting rates. Uh, we could see the money printer turned on again, global liquidity return. And all these things kind of dovetail with the bull market uh, coming back for crypto. Yeah. Um what are your thoughts? Are you still anticipating rate cuts or, or you think this year? I, might I don't, I, I, I don't know how you cut rates hmm. when uh, you claim that the economy is so great and everything's so wonderful and jobs are so good. Now, when you look at other indicators like, you know, yield curve, you know, steepening, that's usually imminent to a, a recession you look at you know all the ism numbers have plummeted the pmis are down uh the the you know the empire state index which is not really awesome but it's it's atrocious i mean it's it's like saying we're, we're in recession right now so in that environment yeah they should they should cut rates i the problem is people are benchmarking off the wrong average. Mm. Average rate is right where we are, around 4%. That's not high. High mm. is 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's high. We never should go to zero again, ever. Right? Mm. We went to zero in the 1930s and early 40s. We went to zero this time. That's for emergencies. That's for like depressions. Sure. We should never be going there. And And you know, to say we need two and a half percent is, I think, kind of silly. Now, the only logic behind that is if you're a deflationist, which I am, and you say that the aging population, right, every day, 10,000 people turn 65 and 65 to 85 year old people are not very productive. And that's, that doesn't mean we're not nice people. They're just not very productive. And so demographically, we're destined to see sub 2% GDP growth and therefore sub 2% interest rates. Yeah, so we're going to look like Japan. That that I could that I could I could go for. So in that environment, yeah, they're going to have to turn on the money printer. And look, the Bank of Japan in 2007 said they were going to stop printing money. Look at an M2 chart in Japan since 2007. It's, yeah. it's they make <laughs> us look like amateurs in money printing. So you know, global money supply is actually contracting right now for the first time in 100 years. I think that reverses. And there's a big meeting coming up between the Fed and the PBOC uh, at WEF. And every year around WEF, the big finance ministers get together. And a couple things happen. One, they say, all right, China, up or down? How much are you going to print? Half a trillion, a trillion? I think the number this time is going to be really big. Let's call it a trillion because their their economy and their stock market is in the toilet. Oh, yeah. So I think that number is going to be big. Uh, the second thing they do is they say, okay, yen, euro, dollar, one of you has to strengthen, the other two can weaken. Hmm. And you know, last year the euro had to go up, the yen was allowed to super weaken, which is why Japanese stocks were up so much, and the dollar was down just a little bit. I think this year... Uh, the yen has to strengthen. So I think Japanese stocks are going to get whacked because without a weak yen, Japan is screwed, like full stop. I think the dollar then uh, weakens modestly. And I think the euro probably weakens. There's probably a good chance to buy European equities here. So um, I think those two things happen. So I do think money printer 
go burr is coming um and that will certainly be a tailwind look post having april 21st 22nd um interesting that having's occur on earth day maybe this year uh mm. and i think what people are finally realizing is that you know bitcoin is actually climate positive right because it it allows you to do things like flex the grid and capture stranded gas and all these other stranded uh, electricity out outlets like wind and solar. So it's actually a really good technology, which is what it is, a technology. And so I think all of that lines up really well to crypto fall, which starts in June, to just a, a parabolic kind of aligning of the stars. There was a terrible, and I mean terrible, uh, special Christmas special this year called Family Swap or Family Switch, Family Switch. And it was like a Freaky Friday type thing. And, you know, this family and Jennifer Garner and the family went to the observatory to see the five planets align. And this, you know, uh, gypsy makes them all swap. So the <laughs> son and the daughter and the mom and the dad, all the stuff swaps. Horrible movie. I mean, it was it was <laughs> cringe to watch. But the idea of this planetary alignment, right, once in you know a thousand years, and it's not once in a thousand years, but the planetary alignment happening this year for digital assets is really good. Mm. And, and I think that means, you know, from a macro perspective, uh, you want to count on things like, um, you know, weaker economic growth, increasing liquidity, uh, rising commodity prices, rising um, Japanese yen, you know, weakening other currencies. I mean, some back, you know, some some tailwind for places like China, and certainly tailwind for for digital assets. So, Mark, uh, do you think we see new all time highs for Bitcoin this year? Not the blow up top peak, but new all time highs. Maybe we end the year eighty k, or do you think we cross six figures? I think we had six figures. You know, my my I, I do these 10 surprises every year. And, and one of mine was, you know, that we hit six figures. I, we definitely take out the all-time high. Mm. That could happen in days, right? Sure. Once people realize that these ETFs are taking out more Bitcoin out of the market than is mined every day. And after the halving, it's going to be two or three times mm. that. So it's just supply-demand problem. So we had the demand shock. And, you know, basic supply and demand, right? If demand goes up and supply is fixed, P1 is higher than P2, basic economics. But if then supply shrinks, right, P2 is higher than P1. Mm -hmm. So we're having a demand shock right now, and we're going to have a supply shock in April, where we go from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450. You put those two things together, number go up. And mm. then we haven't even talked about the FOMO part and the leverage part and the yeah. stupid part where, you know, dumb people play dumb, you know, dumb games and get and win dumb prizes. Yeah. And people will lever up again, which is not smart. You know, why would you ever lever up an 80 vol asset? We right? can't help why ourselves. Would... Agree. I know right? we can't help ourselves. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and for, it will, a, a complex question I want to ask because we're seeing Bitcoin continue to grow. New financial products are being added. You know, El Salvador made it a legal tender. Uh, possibly we might see that happen in Argentina with a new president. We have these ETFs. We're seeing global awareness around Bitcoin grow. I'm very curious when you think we might see central banks hold Bitcoin. And could that be a solution yeah. to the fiat problem that we you know have dealt with for hundreds of years? Oh, again, really great question. So, um, so yes, we will see central banks adopt Bitcoin um, the same way that central banks eventually adopted the renminbi. Mm. Right. So, at first, you know, all the central banks own gold. Gold is the base layer of money, and then they hold other currencies of each other as a store of value, and then they issue currency on top of that. So, gold is the base layer. Bitcoin is digital gold. So at some point, 
the smart ones are going to say, you know what, I'm going to put some in there. And the, the challenge of that, though, is that doesn't solve the, the problem. The inherent problem of fiat is, and this goes back to the Rothschild family in 1607 when they created the first central bank. Central banking, while, while fractional reserve banking, I believe, is a great thing. Right, the, the ability to lever up deposits by rehypothecating, you know, nine, ten, eleven times, and using fractional reserve. I'm a huge fan. There are other people that don't like that. I believe it is why we can do what we're doing right now: sit yes. in nice, warm places, even though it's freezing right. outside, and talk in real time in HD. It's amazing, and yeah. I always say, if you don't like set fractional reserve banking. Name a country that doesn't have good fractional reserve banking that you would live in. Mm. I'll wait because there isn't one. There's no. No, you know, no, no one's moving to Democratic Republic Congo intentionally. No one's moving to Malawi intentionally. And, I, I, and I'm not criticizing. It's just it. Given a choice, you're yeah. going to go where fractional reserve banking works. Right. But central banking is different. What central banking does is it allows you to create money out of thin air by fiat. Yeah. And it's used to finance wars. And that's why the most powerful central bank had the world reserve currency and was the superpower. So you think about the Netherlands in the 1600s was the superpower globally. Are you kidding me? It's the size of Ohio. Hmm. Well, they could print money and create mercenary forces that, you know, and then the Rothschild clan, they sent one kid, to France, shockingly, France became superpower. They sent one to the UK, shockingly, the UK became superpower. They sent a representative over to the new colony in America to set up our central bank. So shockingly, you know, and so you follow that path of money and you follow fractional, you follow central banking. Right. Two things happen. One, you become very powerful and very wealthy for a very small number of people at the top. I would say, you know, the all seeing eye. But what really happens is the value of the currency for everybody else falls. Yeah. And I ask people all the time, what's the lowest price you remember for a gallon of gas? For me, right? 33 cents in Totem Lake, you know, near Kirkland, Washington, before it was cool. And today, you know, it's it's three dollars and thirty-three cents. It's the same gallon of gas. It does the same thing in the car. It's actually less good because it has ethanol. Gas didn't get better, the money got worse. Yeah. And a house used to cost, you know. $10,000. Now it's $400,000. House didn't get better. Now they are bigger and they have nicer plumbing, and all, but but it's a house right? and has the same functionality. And the land and it didn't get more efficient. It didn't grow. Like my house doesn't grow. It actually wears out. So what happens is the money gets worse. And that's why Bitcoin is so amazing. One Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. Will always be one Bitcoin. But we don't price Bitcoin in Bitcoin. We price Bitcoin in dollars or yen or euros. And Bitcoin in dollars just keeps going up. Just like gold. Gold is priced in dollars, not in gold. One ounce of gold is still one ounce of gold. A one ounce coin could buy you a fine person suit for 5,000 years. Mm -hmm. From Cleopatra's time to a suit of armor to Savile Row today. Take a one ounce coin, you get a fine person suit. It's amazing. Perfect store of value. And Bitcoin is just digital form of that. And it will ultimately be in central banks. Ultimately, it will be a base layer of money. Unfortunately, we'll still have fiat problems. They'll probably get worse, right? Because there'll be CBDCs, which mm -hmm. are evil incarnate. Although, and it's amazing how fast people will jump on something. Like, I'm not sure Donald Trump knows what a cbdc is really I, I, i'm not yeah. sure he, he might yeah but vivek does yeah and vivek went from running for president to trying to be vice president to whispering in the donald's ear hey you can get a lot of voters if you say you hate cbdc's yeah bang <laughs> the donald if nothing else he's a good politician right. so um that was amazing and so does that mean we're not going to have a CBDC. 
Not necessarily because the powers that be really want them. Yeah. Because if you listen to the BIS guy, he wants to control your right. money. He wants to be able to say, oh, you didn't spend your money by Friday. Oh, it's gone. Oh, you didn't spend the money in the company in the companies we like. Mm. Money's gone. Oh, you drunk texted about the president. Your money's not worth anything anymore. I mean, people say that could never happen. Are you joking? Of course it could happen. Easy. Programmable money means control, surveillance. I mean, and it wasn't this WEF, but last year's WEF, this this guy was talking about, you know, personal carbon footprint tracking. Yeah. And like, are you joking? It's crazy. Really? What does that really mean? It means you're going to monitor where I eat, how I travel, where I travel, what I spend my money on. What is that? That's surveillance. That's not, that has nothing to do with carbon. It has right. nothing to do with carbon. It has to do with surveillance and control. And CBDCs are the same thing. So CBDCs are fiat on steroids, which would be worse than fiat. Governments aren't going to give up fiat until it's taken away from them. Mm. There have been 775 paper currencies in the history of the world. Three quarters of them no longer exist. Governments will always eventually shoot themselves in the head. So, Mark, do you, do you think it's like another 100 years where there's Bitcoin further iteration on Bitcoin, if you want to call it that, that we are able to, to move away uh, where, I don't know, the web you is, know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a great problem to think about. And mm -hmm. hypothesize the reality is the fight's going to be a lot harder than we think. It's funny, you know, I, I've been talking about, you know, 09 to 15 was first they ignore you. Okay. Then 16 to 21, then they laugh at you. And then 22 to 27, then they fight you. So we're right in the then they fight you. And someone said, Oh, well, we we got the ETF approved. Now we've won. Like, oh no, 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 no. Now they're going to fight harder. Yeah. Right. Now they're going to try to ban self custody. Yeah. Now they're going to try, you know, Max and Stacy believe they're going to try to confiscate the ETF, Bitcoin. Like, no, they won't. Well, why not? Because that's like a 51% attack. There'll never be a 51% attack on Bitcoin. Well, why not? Because the moment you do a 51% attack, the value goes to zero. So all that money you spent, to do a 51% attack, which is pretty much impossible without a quantum computer, so not gonna happen anytime soon. But even if you did it, the value would go to zero and you'd have nothing left. So the same thing with confiscation. Let's say the, the Bitcoin ETFs get 25% of all the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That'd be amazing. The price would be much higher, but let's say they got 25% and the government seizes it. What just happened? They didn't kill it. The 75% just got more value. Satoshi himself said, yes, coins will be lost or stolen. Mm -hmm. Consider it a donation yeah. to the community because the value of the asset goes up. Right. Because you got the same value divided by a smaller number of coins. So unless they can get all of them, 100%, not 99, because as long as there's one Bitcoin, it can have a high price and it can be satoshiized so they can't seize it yes they could in their minds oh we'll we'll steal a bunch of it and then it won't be as effective no you idiots it's infinitely divisible be right. because it's not changeable one bitcoin is one bitcoin the idiot part is the fiat can go to infinity literally which means Everything can go to zero in Bitcoin terms. And there's a lot of discussion now. Preston Pish did a good one on this and and Gary Cardone's done it. And, you know, it, it's it's real, right? I mean, my house priced in Bitcoin just keeps getting cheaper, not more expensive. Yeah. Hmm. Mark, I wish we had another hour to talk about this. Yeah, no, it's always fun. Always <laughs> fun. I appreciate the invite. I'll do it again. And uh, thanks to everybody for listening. And um, thanks for everybody for thinking crypto, right? Yeah. Mark, well, uh, next time, uh, if you're up for it, we could do like a, seriously, a two hour session because I want to get, I guess, not too philosophical, but talk about these uh, 
problems we have and how could Bitcoin be a solution? And it could be looking like a hundred years in the future. I don't know, but. Yeah, no, happy to do it. I, I like cliffhangers. We can do it in two parts and people kind of have to wait a while and, and uh, it'll just be like the marshmallow test. How long are people willing to wait before they hit play on the second <laughs> episode? For sure. Mark, thank you. Always great information and insights. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. Thank you.